Our scripture reading this morning comes from the New Testament, the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 1 through 21. Jesus feeds the 5,000. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they all had had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Jesus walks on the water. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of this his holy word. Gracious God, may each individual hear the individual message that you have for each one of us through this sermon. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Today's reading and lesson is found in all four Gospels, which with only insignificant differences existing between the four accounts. Two weeks ago, in the reading from Mark chapter 6, our reading back then had the feeding of the 5,000 before the reading, and Jesus walks on water, miracles after the reading. Now, we didn't get into the miracles then, but today we do. If you will remember in Mark's lesson, Jesus and his disciples were so busy with doing healings and casting out demons that Mark said that they had no downtime, no time for leisure, not even time to eat. So Jesus looks to the disciples and says, let's go get some rest. Let's rest a while. Because we all know that if you don't take rest, you will fall apart. So they're on their way to this quiet place, and in verse 2 it says, the multitudes began to follow him. Now, we don't, they didn't follow Jesus because they were necessarily interested in him, but because they were wanting to be entertained by him. See, he was considered a miracle worker in those days, and they wanted to see what he would do next. Others looked to him as a physician that could heal them from their afflictions. So they followed him, not because they really were true followers of his. They weren't true believers, but because they were either being entertained or helped out by Jesus himself. They saw the miracles which they had performed. And by the way, in John, the Gospel of John, John calls miracles signs. 
So Jesus goes up on the mountain, and lo and behold, he lifts his eyes, and he sees this great crowd coming, a whole multitude of people coming towards him. And he looked at Philip, and he said, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Now, this is a test for Philip. And we know it's a test because we are told that Je in Scripture that Jesus already knew what he was going to do. He looks at the crowd coming towards him, and he doesn't say to his disciples, guys, look at the crowd coming towards us, let's get out of here. Because Jesus knows that these people are not really believers, but rather want something from him. Again, maybe, entertain, maybe he wants to be entertained, maybe they want to be healed. But Jesus is so incredibly kind. He looks and he sees this crowd coming in his direction, and he knows that their motives are not pure. He knows that they are shallow motives. But he still looks at them. And Scripture says, has compassion for them. He cares about them. He says, let's care for them. And then again, he turns to Philip. Why Philip? Well, because this is close to Philip's hometown. This is the area from where Philip is from. He is giving Philip an opportunity to make a bold statement of faith. And this is the only time that Jesus asks this kind of question of his disciples. Scripture tells us that he asked this only to test him, for he already knew in his mind what he was going to do. Now, Philip hears the question and he, and he responds. It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Now, Philip sees this crowd and he thought about money. He thought, we don't have enough money. When I read that statement, when I read that he, that he said, you know, it would take more than half, it would take about eight months' wages, is one, one translation. Boy, I thought, isn't that true about our country? People think that money is the answer. The answer is not money. The answer is not wealth. The answer is the master. The answer is believing in the one asking the question. Then Andrew speaks up. And you have to love Andrew. Andrew is the guy in Scripture that is always bringing people to Jesus. He brought his brother Peter to Jesus, and later he would bring some Greeks that were from out of the area to, to meet Jesus. If someone wanted to know more about Jesus, it was usually Andrew who brought them to Jesus. And here he speaks up and says, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go amongst so many? We all know that Jesus feeds the 5,000 people. I mean, 5,000 men, including men, including women and children, is probably close to 15 to 20,000. With a small, if not a tiny bit of food, those two small fish and five, five barley loaves end up becoming baskets and baskets that are left over, 12 to be exact. And we all know sort of the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey says, but now I just want to talk about a few takeaways from this section of our scripture. The first thing I want us to catch, no pun intended, it's a fish story. Okay, I know it's early, but it's not that early. <laughs> the first thing I want us to catch is the compassion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Even after he has healed the sick and been so busy that they have no time to eat, his main concern was still the crowd that followed him. We will see his compassion again when he gives his life for us on the cross. The second thing I want to point out is that Jesus uses other people to bless other people. Here Jesus asks the disciples to find food, and Andrew finds this boy with a sack lunch. So they mug the boy, they take his lunch... Okay, nobody's paying attention now, right? 
No, Scripture doesn't say that, but I was just seeing if you were awake. <laughs> Obviously, you're not. So maybe I need to play, have Dan play that first note in the hymn, wake everybody up again. Scripture doesn't say that. Don't want anybody walking out of here. But Jesus uses his disciples and this small boy. And when we examine the word for the small boy, it indicates that the boy was actually six or seven years old. So Jesus uses this child and his disciples to bless the crowd. Another lesson to see in this part is that when God asks you to be a blessing to others and we feel inadequate, we must have faith that even the most humble action done with faith in God can have huge effects on many lives. Look at the results of the two small fish and five barley loaves. Twelve baskets left over. Even the smallest things placed in the hands of Jesus will exceed our expectations. So nothing we encounter in our lives here on earth is too big for God to handle. We have to turn it over to him and have faith that he is in control. So after this miraculous feeding, Jesus sends his disciples ahead of him to cross the Sea of Galilee in a boat. The scripture says they were about three or four, hour, three or four miles into the sea is when they see Jesus walking across the water. Their first reaction is fear, and I'm sure that would be ours as well, thinking that they had seen a ghost. And then Jesus says, It is I, don't be afraid. The Greek words for this phrase is ego I me, a me, which translates I am. And in such circumstances, Jesus walking on the water in the middle of the, in the, middle of the night, only Jesus' words, I am, words that point to Jesus' divine divinity and identity could have reassured the disciples in this circumstance. Now, I'm sure most of you recognize those words from Moses' encounter with God at the burning bush where Moses, is, Moses asks God, what he is to say to the Israelites when they ask, what God has sent him to them. And God replies, I am who I am. So again, what can we learn from this part of our passage? One of the first things that I think we need to realize is that even when Jesus is, even in Jesus' busy schedule, he made time with God the Father a priority. He went up to the mountainside alone and sent the disciples on a boat across the lake. So we as Christians need to always make spending time with God a priority in our lives, even amongst our busy schedules. Another thing we can learn from this part of Scripture is that the disciples at first didn't recognize that it was Jesus walking on the water. See, sometimes in the storms of life, with all the chaos happening around us, it's hard to find Jesus in the storm. I read a story the other day that I believe fits pretty well as an example for tying these two passages we are studying this morning. The title of the story is The Peanut Butter Story. It is written by a single mom, and she writes, these are her words, during a season of my life when I was a single mom and struggling financially, one of my daughters came and asked me what might seem like a simple request, she said. It's been a while since we've had any peanut butter. Could we get some? I told her I'd see what I could do about that. And she went off to bed. Well, I remember lying on the couch and crying like a baby, she writes because I knew there was no money to buy peanut butter with. I had a good old-fashioned pity party. I cried out to God and told him how unfair it was that my children had to do without such a simple request over circumstances that were out of their own control. I told God I felt ashamed to question him and complain when we certainly had not gone hungry. 
Many friends and my church family had been faithful to help us. God had shown his faithfulness time and time again. I told him, it surely would be nice to be able to go to the store and get not only our needs, but also a few wants like peanut butter. I cried myself to sleep feeling like a failure as a mother. The peanut butter was just the straw that pushed me over the edge of much financial stress, she writes. The next morning I got up to run to the Meals on Wheels route that I worked that summer. I took one of my daughters every morning so that I could have some special time with each daughter who went for that day. The same one who asked me about the peanut butter went with me that day. We got to one of the houses and this sweet old lady who, was, who lived there asked if I could wait one minute after we had given her her meal. She went into her house and she came back with a jar in her hands. Then she proceeded to say, when my groceries were delivered yesterday, this jar of peanut butter was with them. I called and told them that I received this jar of peanut butter and I had not ordered it or paid for it. The person I spoke to told me to keep it and enjoy it. Well, I kept thinking about this, peanut, this jar of peanut butter in my cabinet all last night. And when I got up this morning, I thought about you and your little girls coming by here every day. I don't want to offend you by offering you a jar of peanut butter, but would you like to take this jar of peanut butter? I'm sure she wondered why I was crying before she even finished the question. Absolutely, we would love to have such a precious gift. In that moment, it was more valuable than a jar full of gold. Sure, a jar full of gold would have bought a household full of, jar, full of groceries, but not the lesson my children and I learned that day that we have never forgotten. God does hear our prayers. He hears our heart cries. He hears a little girl say, can we get some peanut butter when there's no money to buy it? That little lady could have given us a loaf of bread or a bag of potatoes, but it would not have been the miracle that God wanted us to have. It would, not have, it would have been appreciated, but not something that I would remember so vividly 30 years later. My God is an awesome God, and He cares about me personally. He cares about you, too, bringing your needs and your concerns to Him. Bring them to Him. He will show you how big He is, how loving He is, and how able He is. End quote. This is a true story by, Benny, by Penny Cook. I think the final lesson that we can learn from this story is that when Jesus climbed into the boat, the storm stopped. I know, I believe that we all want Jesus in our boat. We want a calm, a relaxed, a peaceful life, don't we? But sometimes in life we have to get out of the boat. And that takes faith. So we need to always make time to spend with God a top priority in our life. We need to be able to recognize the Lord even when he is far away from us. And we need to keep Jesus in our boat with us if we can. But when we do get out of the boat, we need to take Jesus with us all the time. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, I give you thanks for this message. And I pray that each individual will receive your message for them today. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.